wish to thank the Korean, uh, the Korea Foundation for its warm hospitality and for the opportunity uh, for me to uh, share with you uh, some considerations in relation to my, to my work. In particular, I would like to uh, uh, thank the President, Ambassador Kim, uh, and his colleagues for their uh, initiative. Um, it is, this is my first uh, trip to uh, Korea, but I have to say, um, having been in the job for less than a year, I have uh, had ample opportunity to uh, 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 witness the strong engagement of Korea as a cooperation partner of the OSC uh, within, within the organization. Uh, uh, today I will meet with uh, the foreign minister, and uh, uh, I realize that he was also uh, ambassador to the OSC at some point in his, uh, in his career before taking up this post. Uh, and before that, I worked for the UN, and, uh, and the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who was my, bo my boss, was also uh, uh, ambassador of Korea to, uh, to Austria and is very familiar with the OSC. So, um, o OSC today, what, what is it? Uh, your, and my presentation comes at, a, at an important time in the OSC. It's a time when there is a fundamental debate starting on where the organization is going, how it should develop, taking into account of the uh, uh, strong evolution uh, of the uh, uh, geopolitical, geostrategic conditions uh, in, in Europe, in the wider Europe, as, uh, as we look at it from uh, the OSC perspective since the time of Helsinki. Uh, and the organization has evolved a lot. Uh, it was a conference at the time, and then uh, uh, once the Cold War was over, the job for the OSC was to manage uh, the situation that resulted uh, from it, including uh, the disgregation, dissolution of, of certain countries, the former Yugoslavia, the former Soviet Union, and, uh, and still uh, there's a lot of, uh, of that work ongoing. Uh, but then with the turn of the century, we started looking at the global issues and also our own approach of security uh, changed in many ways, security that was traditionally from the time of the Cold War, uh, looked at uh, from the perspective of security as a zero-sum game. Uh, uh, the, the, the arms control, the search for balance, and the search for stability. Um, at some point, uh, this equation changed because uh, the global challenges uh, um, uh, became such that the security could be perceived by many as a win-win uh, situation. Uh, as uh, countries cooperate uh, on uh, uh, addressing uh, the threat of terrorism, on addressing uh, organized crime, uh, trafficking, etc., uh, then, then the, uh, uh, the mode of operation changes and the way an organization equips itself to deal with it also, also changes. Um, I'm now um, in Korea and I'm looking forward to my uh, participation to the Jeju Forum uh, tomorrow. Uh, but this trip will, will bring me also to Mongolia uh, in, in the next few days, and uh, that will be also an interesting uh, uh, new step, because Mongolia has uh, uh, requested to become a full participating state of the OSCE. Mongolia is now a partner country, and has opened the discussion uh, about a possible further expansion of the organization, which is a regional organization a regional organization under Chapter 8 of the uh, UN Charter. And, uh, and that's an interesting uh, debate, and I will refer to that in a, in a minute in itself. Uh, but it's also a sign that the uh, agenda, what the OSC stands for, is something that is considered interesting by, uh, by participating, by the, the um, uh, uh, countries that are not uh, member states of the organization. And, uh, and that is in itself an encouraging sign. And then from Korea, we'll proceed to New York, where we will have a, a retreat uh, with the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, a retreat that he will have with the uh, heads of a number of regional organizations to better discuss the division of labor between the UN and the regional organizations. That's also uh, another element in our work that is, uh, uh, that is developing very fast. Um, when, when I say that there is still uh, an agenda that we need really to rethink it, and uh, we're looking also at the time frame for that. Uh, uh, 2015 will be Helsinki plus 40, as we call it, the 40th anniversary of uh, uh, the Helsinki Final Act. And perhaps that would be a good occasion to try to uh, develop an agenda that, uh, uh, that reflects uh, the current uh, state of affairs taking into account uh, uh, all these elements that I, that I mentioned, the new, uh, uh, the new approach to security, but also new relationships within the organization. 
there is an issue and there is a debate within the organization now. There is an issue of unfinished reconciliation. And some of the conflicts and uh, uh, some of the issues that we still have on the agenda also go back to that. Go back to a problem that was uh, resolved, uh, was solved in its uh, 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 immediate uh, uh, expression, but uh, when the, the deeper roots um, still uh, uh, need to be addressed because there is still uh, a possibility uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that crisis may, may resurface. And therefore, uh, we feel we need to be more thorough in the way uh, uh, we conduct a dialogue and we uh, deal with the relations between our participating states. Uh, the, the OSC, uh, and just to try to define it very briefly, the OSC is, as I say, is, is a regional organization, uh, but it takes into account also uh, uh, regional relations in a, in a broader way, taking into account uh, uh, geopolitical, geostrategic considerations. Though we have a transatlantic dimension because that's very uh, uh, visible uh, when you're in Europe. But there's also a Eurasian dimension, a Eurasian dimension which we inherited in a way uh, uh, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and with the Central Asian countries become uh, uh, full parties in the, in the organization. And, and this Mongolia uh, debate, so there's also this, uh, this expansion there. Uh, and this Eurasian dimension uh, got even more uh, profile in the organization uh, with the uh, uh, Kazakh chair uh, a, few, uh, a few years, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, and, and Kazakhstan managed uh, uh, something that uh, uh, a number of uh, previous predecessors didn't manage to do, that was to have a summit. Uh, of OEC heads of state and government, and the summit that in fact started uh, putting down the new agenda for the organization. Uh, it, it introduced the notion of a security community, and, uh, and this notion is something we are working on to try to, uh, uh, to develop it as a new, uh, as a new approach to, uh, uh, to security, but still based on, uh, on the Helsinki approach, uh, the security that is viewed across, uh, uh, across various dimensions, as we call them, uh, the, the narrower political military uh, set of tools that we have, the confidence building measures, uh, 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 the code of conduct on political military relations, the small arms, and the work that is done on, on many uh, small but very concrete aspects of, uh, of security issues, the relations between the military. I think that was an important element in overcoming the legacy of the Cold War. Uh, developing relations between military establishments uh, that used to consider uh, each other enemies. And where uh, after, after a few years we saw uh, the military people coming together and being friendly to each other, that changed the spirit and that created the basis for a new, uh, for a new relationship uh, in, this, uh, in this wider community of, uh, of countries. Uh, the human dimension, um, assisting countries in uh, 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 strengthening their democratic institution, uh, upholding uh, uh, rule of law, uh, human rights, <coughs> fundamental, fundamental freedoms. Uh, that is something that the OSC has always considered as an integral part of a broad concept, of a broad approach to security. And in the OSC, we can legitimately look into issues that uh, countries may regard as, uh, as having to do with their internal affairs. But still, this is something that can be done in the OSC. And uh, there are sometimes very sensitive, very delicate, very difficult debates within the organization dealing with these issues. But the very fact that we manage to have those debates is very healthy. And it helps uh, the organization and the community proceed on its, uh, in its way and trying to deal with its problems in, in some areas more successfully, in some other areas uh, uh, less, perhaps. And, and they're still. Uh, obviously work, work to be done also uh, internally for us. And then we have also an economic dimension where we look at, uh, uh, at the security aspects. Of course, we are not, uh, we are not an organization that deals with uh, development issues, but, but certainly uh, there is uh, a, a, a very strong uh, commitment to uh, uh, assisting countries in, uh, in in, in developing smoothly, but also in addressing 
uh, those issues. Energy security is something that we are now discussing, for instance, and it's, it's very sensitive in Europe. Uh, um, the next uh, uh, chairmanship of the OSCE Ukraine has already told us they want to make uh, in the economic dimension a priority for themselves uh, the, issue of, um, the issue of energy, of energy security. Um, so uh, this is giving us an agenda that is, uh, that is very broad, that is very comprehensive. Astana gave us also another important concept, and that's the concept that uh, the security of the OEC uh, uh, states is uh, inextricably linked, as it put it, uh, uh, the, the Astana document, uh, with the um, security of its neighboring countries. And that's why uh, we are paying more attention uh, to the relations that we have uh, uh, with our partners, and, uh, um, and in some areas we operationalize them increasingly. Uh, for instance, on Afghanistan, there was a decision by our ministerial council in December, and we're now really looking at how we can uh, address Afghanistan-related issues uh, uh, more concretely, more operationally. And for us, it's not, for an organization like ours, it's not a matter of uh, going into Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan remains, uh, remains a partner country. But we look at how we can work from Central Asia, using uh, um, the fact that Central Asian participating states are, in a way, the front line of uh, the engagement of the OSC towards, uh, uh, towards Afghanistan, and see how we can assist these countries in Central Asia in two ways. Uh, one is uh, to uh, better protect themselves from the potential security challenges that could stem uh, from Afghanistan. Um, and we have taken a number of initiatives. For instance, in, in Tajikistan, in Dushanbe, we have set up uh, a, uh, um, a border management staff college where we train about um, 500 border guards every year. And, and we train Tajik and Afghan border guards together. Uh, so that the standards are the same, but also they get to know each other and they work and they work better together. And, and we work with the other countries of the region. Some, some of them are more autonomous and need less support, others do need, uh, do need more support. In, uh, in Tajikistan, again, we are now developing also a, a patrolling program on the border. It's, uh, the border is extremely long, it's 1,300 kilometers, and, uh, and the Tajiks do need, uh, do need support. Uh, we're looking at uh, police cooperation in, uh, in the region. Um, so this is one, one mode of operation. The second is uh, uh, with the Istanbul process, looking at Afghanistan post-2014, and, and as I have, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is going to progressively disengage, uh, there will be a larger responsibility, a larger ownership for the countries of the region in dealing uh, with Afghanistan and assisting Afghanistan. So the second mode is, is in fact, uh, uh, helping those countries assist, better assist Afghanistan. And so trying to be more strategic, and we are having a discussion within the organization uh, to see how can we best reach out uh, uh, to Afghanistan, but still doing it from the countries of the region primarily, and with the support of the whole uh, OSCE community to the extent that this is, uh, uh, this is possible. Um, the other uh, area where we engage with partners more operationally is the Mediterranean. Uh, the Arab Spring uh, is having an impact, uh, an impact also on the security of the OSCE, and so we are reaching out also to the countries of the region where there are uh, processes of democratic transition uh, that are obviously very different from the ones we witnessed within the OSCE area, but still the experiences that we have developed in the OSCE, some of the tools that we have uh, uh, um, uh, creating the OSC to address transition in our own area uh, are relevant. Uh, uh, they will need to be adapted, of course, but in this situation. And so we are uh, now discussing individually with, the, with various countries of the region, and I will travel to Jordan and Israel later, later in June um, uh, to discuss uh, initiatives of, uh, of cooperation with those countries. I was in Egypt, I had a meeting with the Secretary General of the Arab League, I've seen that the Arab League would like also, is looking at the OSC with interest because would like also to develop itself uh, some more operational tools uh, to address some of these, uh, some of the problems that they have in their own region. So the interaction um, um, between uh, uh, regional organizations is something that is also developing and that is, to go back to the initial point, is very much encouraged by the United Nations. 
the United Nations that need also to streamline their own operations and to empower more uh, the regional organization, but in a way that is very uh, uh, synergic. Uh, for us, uh, um, we, we continue working very much on uh, trying to prevent conflicts. That, that remains, uh, the, the, uh, uh, in a way, the, the fundamental tool for our operation. And we are still, just to give you an example, um, this month uh, uh, we have been uh, involved in facilitating uh, Serbian elections in Kosovo. And that's something that only a couple of months earlier we didn't know we would be doing. We were planning to go and, uh, and monitor, as we uh, do in all our participating states, observe uh, elections in Serbia. But uh, when I asked the Serbs, how are you going to handle your elections in Kosovo, uh, the answer was straightforward. The Serbs were saying, well, Kosovo is Serbia, so we'll go there, we'll organize the elections, and our uh, citizens will vote. Then we heard the Kosovars uh, say that if the Serbs only try to organize elections in Kosovo, we'll send in the special police units and we'll close down all the police stations. So we all thought we had a problem. Uh, the NATO people sent uh, some reinforcement battalions, some reserve battalions down to Kosovo. They were getting ready to, uh, 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 to manage a crisis there. Uh, uh, I traveled down with the chairmanship. I went, uh, I went to Pristina to talk to the Kosovo leadership and to the NATO and the EU people there. I went to Belgrade. And in three weeks, we started a negotiation and we found uh, an agreement where, whereby the OSC would organize the Serbian elections in Kosovo. OSCE flags everywhere instead of Serbian flags. And the, the Serbs gave us the voters' lists and, uh, and all the, the voting material. We collected all the votes and we gave the, 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 the ballot boxes back to the Serbs. The Kosovars were happy because uh, we did it under Resolution 1244 with the UN blessing. And, and it worked. It was an operation that we had to set up in, uh, in five days because that was the time we had between the moment we finalized the agreement with the two sides and, uh, and the voting uh, day, whereas we thought we'd, uh, it would take us a month uh, to, to, to do that at least. But uh, when, when it needs to be done, uh, it can be done one way or another. And perhaps they were not a model election, but nobody was hurt. Everybody who wanted to vote managed to vote, and the votes went back. And, and, the whole thing, and the whole thing worked. And then now, as, as we are looking at, uh, at the results of this, and, uh, and we got, uh, uh, I, I was talking to the Secretary General of NATO, and I was telling him, you have your troops there, please make sure that instead of dealing with a, with a crisis that probably we think won't happen, make sure that they look after our people, because we, we are not so sure how this thing will work, and he was very forthcoming in that, and, uh, and very grateful when he saw he didn't have to use and didn't have to keep the reserve forces in Kosovo, he could, he could withdraw them. One of the things we noticed is that uh, by uh, setting up this operation so quickly, we just moved people in. It didn't cost us a penny. We really used the uh, resources we had, uh, replacing them, moving people from, uh, yeah, if you, if you travel, uh, if you tickets, uh, to, for, for experts who went down, but, but really it was a very cheap operation uh, that prevented a situation that would have cost a lot in, in terms of uh, human, li human lives, possibly in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, redeployment of military forces and, and maintaining them on the ground, but also in terms of the political process that might have had, uh, uh, also might have hit obstacles and it's, it's still complicated as it is, the Kosovo issue, of course, but it would have, uh, it would have gotten even worse. So working on conflict prevention is, uh, in a way, uh, not expensive, and, uh, uh, and it's always a good investment for the, for the international community. The downside of it is that it's not visible. When you're successful, nobody knows it. If I'm not telling you these things now, you wouldn't know it. And that's, that's a bit the nature, uh, uh, the nature of, these, um, uh, of these initiatives, and it's always a hard sell. Uh, but it's always the best investment for, uh, for the international community. It's a bit of a problem that also the OSC has with its own visibility, because as we operate on you know, preventing conflicts, and we engage continuously in dialogue, negotiations, etc., uh, this is something that is uh, uh, not only visible, but sometimes, not only not visible, but sometimes uh, uh, it, it is uh, um, willingly kept uh, uh, at a very, very low profile, uh, uh, because the success of some of these initiatives very often depends on uh, not letting anybody know that they are taking place. 
and making sure that uh, uh, all little crises, all little problems are solved as we, uh, as we proceed. Um, one word before, before concluding so that we can have a bit of a, of a discussion on, uh, um, on Korea's engagement. I think it's, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, um, Korea is a very active uh, uh, partner uh, of, uh, of the OSCE. Uh, we also have periodic uh, updates in the Permanent Council from uh, your ambassador, from your representative in Vienna, uh, on the situation on the Korean uh, Peninsula. And uh, um, also with the Asian partners in general, I think they, the interaction is stepping up. Uh, I was uh, a couple of months ago in Thailand, there was uh, um, a, 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 the annual uh, conference uh, with, uh, with the Asian partners. And then Thailand hosted a workshop on, uh, um, uh, on their own experiences in the Golden Triangle on uh, cutting the opium production and, uh, and uh, uh, developing alternative, uh, alternative uh, forms of livelihood. And uh, we invited the Afghan experts there. And it was very good to have this exposure of, uh, of experts coming from one of our partner countries to the experience of another partner countries. And uh, the, the OSC was chosen as a platform for this, uh, for this operation, which was, uh, I found, uh, very, very interesting. The Mongolians did something similar. Uh, they wanted to organize a workshop for uh, Afghan diplomats, and they did it via the OSC. And so we, we sent, uh, uh, of course, when it comes to Afghanistan, we, we assist them a lot, and we uh, also bring uh, uh, Afghans in, in many of our own initiatives. But it was good that the country like Mongolia wanted to play this role, and, uh, and we facilitated that, and we started also uh, uh, this sort of regional, uh, uh, regional inter interaction. So um, on, on Korea, I'm looking forward myself uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the forum, uh, to the Jeju forum and to the discussions there. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that I had this opportunity and I'm looking forward to the meetings I will have in the course of the morning. There will be a meeting also with the, with the foreign minister. Uh, that will be a good opportunity also to see uh, how, we, uh, how we can move from here and how we can uh, uh, step up even more our own, uh, our own interaction. Thank you very much for your hospitality and for this opportunity to talk to you this morning.